there we go. And Babby, that's a recording. So thank you very much for joining me, Tessa. I'm really looking forward um, to hearing all about your story. Um, so do you want to just introduce yourself a little bit and who you're, you're currently cuddling? Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for having me. Uh, my name is Tessa Bell, and this is little Fergus, uh, who was born just over three weeks ago um, by C-section. Um, so yeah, and we're here in Edinburgh, based, based in Edinburgh. Fabby, okie dokie. So um, yeah, I thought we'd just start off talking about your pregnancy then. Can you tell us how that was for you? And then also how COVID's kind of affected things and how you find the experience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, found out I was pregnant kind of late January. Um, we actually went through Edinburgh Fertility Clinic. So a little bit of a journey uh, to get uh, Fergus. Uh, so it's quite amazing that I've actually seen him from like a tiny egg, which is quite incredible all the way through to, through to now. Um, obviously that was before the pandemic. Um, so because it was through fertility treatment, my husband was able to come to a six week scan and an eight week scan, um, just to check everything was going okay, which is quite nice. Although at that stage, you know, he just looks like an egg and a little tiny thing. So it wasn't, you know, it's not as exciting as the later scans. And then it was actually my 30th birthday that I hit the kind of 12 week uh, mark. So that's when we began to tell people and it was, that was right the week of lockdown really. Oh wow. Um, so it was really nice to share over Zoom with everyone this amazing news on my birthday, which was really nice. Um, but of course my husband couldn't come to any of the appointments kind of at that stage. So the 12 week scan, the 20 week scan, you know, the antenatal appointments. Um, but the pregnancy went, went really well and I felt actually really lucky in lockdown to have kind of light at the end of the tunnel, I was calling it. Um, <laughs> Although I think I thought by the time he was born, we'd be out of the pandemic, but sadly, that's obviously not the case. Um, and it was maybe about, for me, a week 30, kind of early 30s, I was beginning to think, you know, what position is baby in? Um, and that's where me and my community midwife, Charlotte, were having a fun guessing game, which we called Bummer Head, um, <laughs> to try and, <laughs> try and work out what he was up to. And um, she wasn't quite sure, I wasn't quite sure. Um, so that's when we discovered about week 36 for sure that he was breech. Okay. Um, so yeah, but everything went really smoothly and other than realizing that the uncomfortable pain in my ribs was his legs where they shouldn't be kicking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, everything went, was going really smoothly up to about week 36. And then we got booked in for a scan just to confirm that that's where he was. Um, and then from there, they offered me uh, options to try and sort of where to go from there. So uh, they offered the ECB, I think it's yeah. called. Yeah, um, that's where they, they try and turn baby from the outside. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so for a few, few days, we were kind of deciding whether to go for that procedure and give it a, a shot. Uh, and I should say before this, I'd been doing lots of pregnancy yoga. I'd tried spinning babies. Um, <laughs> I was going to ask that, yeah. <laughs> I, I'd tried all the kind of natural things. I didn't get quite as far as lying upside down on an ironing board, which I read about. Um, <laughs> but, and also um, things like, I think, is it Mox, Moxibustion? Is that? Yeah, is that, yeah that's yeah. So. Just because the pandemic, I found it quite difficult to find out about that sort of thing quickly enough and also I think with you know restrictions I'm not sure if I even would have been able to try it yeah. so in the end uh, we decided to go for the the ECB um, and actually it was also a really I was, I was terrified I'll be honest because it, it's some people describe it like a massage but I'd also heard it could be quite painful yeah. um, but it was it was an incredible um, experience I felt really well looked after um, during that procedure um and it wasn't nearly as worrying as I thought it would be was your um, husband able to be in with you for that he was oh, yeah that's good yeah so he was able to be there um we both had to wear masks and things which was a bit strange really? but yeah. um he was able to come for that and I'm really glad I don't think I could have done that on my own actually because I was quite nervous um end, isn't it yeah and I think when you google things you never find positive 
<laughs> no one posts their positive reviews, they always post their negative experiences, so I was a bit worried about it. Um, but it was fine, and they, um, they give you an injection to kind of relax your stomach, um, and the, the staff kind of talk you through it all. You can even play your own music when they do the procedure. Um, I didn't know that, that's good to know. Which is really nice. Um, and I just used kind of deep breathing, and yoga breath was really helpful to kind of get you in the mood for it. Um, however, unfortunately, it did not work. So yeah. they tried about three times, but Fergus's bum was fully in my pelvis and they just couldn't budge him out. Um, so at that point, that's where they said, we're not going to try anymore. You know, he's just not for budging. Yeah. Um, I, can't, I don't know what the stats are. I think, I think it's like 50% are successful. Yeah, um, it, it's kind of half and half. Um, I think that sounds about right. So, um, yeah, and in Edinburgh they have um, they actually have like a, it's every Wednesday they do the ECV clinic, and it's the same consultants that do it every Wednesday. And mm -hmm. I think that's um, improves the success rate because they're used to. Ah, okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. They're more practiced. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but after that was unsuccessful, that's where they sat me and my husband down and said because he is breech and he was a what's called a frank breech so his legs were kind of very straight um, they did recommend that a cesarean would be the best route to go um, so you know they, they advised against trying for a kind of vaginal birth and they just said you know this is probably safest for you safest for baby so in a way the decision was taken out of our hands I mean we could have still pushed for a, a birth of you know a vaginal birth if we wanted to but yeah it, it Quite, it was quite clear because of his positioning that a c-section was going to be the best option okay that makes um sense. Yeah. so was that how many weeks were you when they kind of made that decision so i think i was week 37 37 okay. at that point creeping into 38 but 37 so it was all quite you know towards the end you know i was kind of full term at that point yeah um so it was all feeling quite quite soon yeah i would imagine <laughs> and, um, in quick succession these things happening and decisions going on and yeah so the next the very next day I got a phone call saying that my um c-section had been booked in for the 28th of September at uh, the end of the month um in Edinburgh so I had about I think 12 days to kind of prepare okay um however that's not what happened <laughs> so I had other ideas <laughs> yeah he did and I think the the best thing the midwife said to me um was just remember that he doesn't know you have a c-section booked um yeah. and that was really good because i think i'd got a bit fixed even in a day i'd got fixated on this date thinking right 28th let's plan towards that get everything organized and she said oh just be aware it could could happen sooner yeah. and quite right she was because you know two days after i'd had the ecb uh, the friday night so it was the 18th uh, waters broke at home um and, and then it was have, a, did you have any sort of niggly pains or anything before the, your waters went or was it just no a, okay <laughs> no no nothing at all um i'd actually um been shopping that morning and had a busy afternoon uh baking with my nieces oh, wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I had absolutely no idea um just went to bed and woke up with a bit of a surprise that waters had broken and yeah, then that was a quick phone call to the, the hospital because that's what they told me to do um, yeah. was just to give the hospital a phone call. So, cool. yeah. Okay, so that was yeah a nice surprise for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so does that mean, would you have sort of just pushed into the 38 weeks once your waters went? Yeah, yeah. So I was at 30, by the time he was born actually it was 38 weeks and four days or 38 and five by the time he actually came yeah okay so yeah quite quick after those conversations and discussions yeah. about your plans so yeah i mean essentially from finding out that we were gonna go for a c-section to having the c-section that was the wednesday and then he was born on the saturday morning so yeah so quite quick then yeah. <laughs> so you didn't hang around no. um so what was what happened after you phoned them what advice did they give you and then kind of how did that progress to the actual yeah. surgery itself yeah, so um, when I phoned triage just to say, you know, waters have broken, um, they said, you know, great. Um, I had to tell them, you know, baby was breached, so we did have a planned C-section booked, but obviously plans have changed. 
and they just said to come in as quickly as possible. Um, luckily, we have a car and we were able to drive to the hospital, but they did even offer an ambulance, which oh, okay. I was like, I was quite surprised actually. I was like, oh, really? You know, they said, yes, we do want you to come in quickly. Um, so I think between phoning and getting to the hospital, it maybe took us about an hour because we had a half hour frantic panic around the house getting things that we needed. Filling stuff um, together. <laughs> Drove to, drove to the hospital, uh, very quickly um, was seen. But I suppose in terms of coronavirus and how that affected things, I, um, when you arrive at the main reception, and this was at Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, um, my husband dropped me off, but he wasn't allowed in immediately. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I had to be um, sort of seen, I suppose, and I was taken, taken through to the kind of triage area. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't until I was in my own room and they'd sort of worked out kind of what was going on that they said, right, you can phone your husband and he can come and sit and wait with you. Okay. That was, that was really, really nice that he was able to do that. Um, and quite, a, quite a relief because otherwise I think it could have been quite a long, a long wait. Yeah. So yeah, we arrived sort of, I suppose early hours of Saturday morning it is now. So it was like one in the morning and it was quite a busy kind of night shift, I think, uh, for them. So there wasn't space in the theatre for me immediately. Okay. Um, so they, they just said, you know, we will, you know, we know you're here. Um, and they put the monitoring straps on me. Um, so they're like monitoring bands just to monitor baby's heartbeat. Um, and it's like a trace. I'm sure you know what it's called. <laughs> yeah, it's a CTG monitor. So you get one one monitor that picks up baby's heartbeat and then the other one sits a bit higher up and that's picking up any um uterine activity so if you're contracting it can pick up yeah. the change in that yeah. well. so exactly. is contracting by this point or yeah yeah so contractions were getting to about i think they were between sort of six five six minutes apart okay um, and then by the time i actually got to theatre they were maybe about every sort of four minutes or so right um, so yes I had the fun of experiencing some contractions as well okay. um, which I'm actually sounds strange but they weren't you know so severe I mean they were strong but they weren't it was quite nice to feel them yeah um, so but but equally I you know I knew that I wasn't going to be going right through to the end so and they did say if they got closer together I would have been bumped up the priority list yeah um, so it was about between yeah one a.m. and then we went to theatre about sort of six a.m. or six thirty a.m. around that time. Okay, and did that feel like a really long wait, or did did it feel like it went really fast for you? Well, actually, um, interestingly, they asked if a, a medical student could come and talk to me, and initially on my birth plan and preferences, um, I'd always said no that I didn't want. I didn't want any medical students uh, around just because I'd kind of read a lot about, you know, you want to have a safe space where you, you know everyone. Yeah. But whatever came over me, I said, yeah, sure. I'd love to chat to them. So um, we had a lovely medical student. She was in her fifth year, chat to us for about four hours, which was absolutely lovely because it just took my mind off things. It's really? So, good. Yeah. I know. It's not, not what I would have expected, you know, in myself, I'd always thought that's not my preference. But then when it actually came to it, it's what I felt like on the in the moment. Um, yeah, I think that catches a lot of people out. They have this idea of how they're going to feel or what they're going to want. And then your your whole mindset changes once you go into labour. So it's quite common for people to to change their preferences slightly. And mm -hmm. I mean, medical students, that's quite common for people, again, to say, no, I don't want any. Um, but then like yourself sometimes you find one that's really interested and really good chat and as you say puts you at ease and distracts you a little bit as well so they do have to she, was, she was great because I said oh do you know who's going to be doing the the surgery and she's like oh yeah it'll be Giovanni he's lovely he's so nice and you know that just put me at ease as well and actually there was a huge benefit to chatting to her and it wasn't a negative at all um, just quickly back on the monitoring again one of my preferences if my if I'd gone with my original birth plan was to not have any continuous monitoring um, and but I mean just to say I mean it I didn't I don't think I even knew what continuous monitoring was and all it was is these like stretchy elastic bands around your stomach they don't hurt at all like it's literally just like a bit of elastic and you get a little clicker and you click when you feel baby's movements 
so it's nothing nothing kind of invasive um whereas i think i don't know i, I think i had misconceptions about what continuous monitoring was okay um, so but it wasn't anything scary or painful at all which yeah i don't know why i thought it would be but it's funny what you build up into your head isn't it you kind of get this idea so well, that's nice to hear as well that it wasn't uncomfortable or, or sore in any way that'll be reassuring for a lot of people as well so yeah. thanks for telling us that bit as well so um so yeah where did you get to um, I suppose, um yeah so i suppose the the it was coming to about sort of five thirty six in the morning and you sort of know that uh, the staff that are on will probably be finishing about eight o'clock for the end of their their shift and I was beginning to think oh gosh maybe I'll be seen by different staff and I'll move over to the next day but then it all happened very quickly they suddenly said right there's a space for you um, here are your gowns uh, you know get changed into your gowns um, and we're going straight upstairs to speak to the anaesthetist um, who will sort of talk through everything with you um, before that, they did go through consent forms with me, yeah. and I had done consent forms earlier in the week, um, but that was for a, a plan section, but because this was technically classed as an emergency section, they had to go through them again. Yeah. Um, but I actually went through them with the, the main kind of surgeon who was, who was doing it, um, which was really good. And then he also talked about um, things that were my preferences that they do anyway, so for example, like delayed cord clamping um, was something that I wanted but he says well that's something that we do as normal here unless there's some medical reason that we can't okay um, so they practice that at Edinburgh as standard um, early skin to skin contact you know that was something that I wanted sort of as soon as possible so you're able to talk about these options um, and there are other things like you can dim the lights you can have your own music um, which actually we didn't have because I'm quite picky when it comes to music and things were beginning to, you know, songs that you thought you liked on your playlist suddenly begun to annoy me. So it's just <laughs> I don't want any music at all. Um, but even, even with my husband as well, we talked about, you know, he said to me, well, what, what do you want me to say, you know, when we're in, in the theatre? Do you want me to be chatty and like crack jokes or do you want me to be just quiet and reassuring? And I think kind of chatting a little bit about what you expect from your birth partner too is probably quite helpful oh like, definitely you they, hold, they, my, they, hold my hand or tell me what's going on or <laughs> yeah it, oh i always say have that conversation ahead of time um because yeah. the birth partner just wants to do the best by you as well and they can feel a bit overwhelmed especially when things happen a bit quicker than planned as well would imagine it caught him by surprise too so um, yeah that's great that you were having those those chats ahead of time yeah um and then yeah you go go up to theater and there's a, you know there's a lot of staff you know I, I probably lost count i feel like there was maybe seven to nine members of staff in the room yeah. everyone kind of introduced themselves let, lets you know what their role is you know so there's a midwife for you midwife for baby an anesthetist uh, two surgeons the medical student who had been chatting to all night she came to Oh, uh, she actually did like the catheter for me <laughs> um okay. which was quite nice for her to get involved and then ample other staff that I can't quite remember what they did or why they were there but um mm -hmm. it actually rather than making me feel sort of scared that there were lots of people there it made me feel you know wow I'm in really safe hands <laughs> like I'm yeah. literally in nine pairs of hands here or however many it was yeah. um and everyone was really friendly and I think the the person I spoke to most um was the anaesthetist so that's obviously quite an important aspect and one of the things that happens first and that actually happened while my husband wasn't in the room yeah. so they do that when it's just just you I, I don't quite know why but that's the rules um and meanwhile he's getting kind of um scrubbed up you know so he had to go and put on his hairnet and his crocs <laughs> and all of that um and then yeah i think people maybe get quite nervous about the the spinal kind of epidural that they put in uh, and please correct me if I'm using the wrong words. Cause... No, no, that's, that's spot on. <laughs> you've, you've nailed it. <laughs> um, and they, you know, it's, they just sort of help you get into a good position because obviously you have to be quite nice and still, which is easier said than done when you are having contractions as well. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so they need to, need to time it um, so that you're obviously not having a contraction and you're nice and relaxed. 
Um, and for anyone that does yoga, uh, the position that they encourage you to get into is basically like angry cat. <laughs> yeah, you um, push the bottom of your spine out, don't you? Which is hard yeah. to put your big bump. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you're sort of pushing your spine out. Um, and actually one of the midwives kind of came forward to the, the bench and I could kind of lean on her, yeah. um, which was really, really nice. And then they, they pop it in. And then quite quickly, they after they've put in... Um, the medicine or whatever they put in yeah. um, they, they get you to lie down um, and that's kind of to help the, the medicine kind of work through your body um, yeah okay so and then in terms of checking it's working um, once you lie down uh, the anaesthetist will begin to like spray you with this spray um, and they'll spray it on your elbow and it's really cold so you can feel it but what's bizarre is they start spraying it on your legs and your stomach and you, you just can't feel a thing you can yeah. hear it, but you just can't feel anything. But then again, that's really reassuring that you know that the that it's worked because obviously yeah. you don't want to hear too much. Absolutely, I know. And so, um, from your sort of perspective, where about on your body did you feel was sort of numb? Um, yeah, I'd say basically just below your kind of breasts, like you know, from your rib cage down, you, yeah. you really can't you really can't feel much at all. Um, you know, you, you begin to lose the sensation pretty quickly. You know, at first you think, oh, I think I can still wriggle my toes and I think I can still lift my heels a bit. But then very quickly, you can't. Um, so it's, yeah, it's basically, yeah, just rib cage all the way down. Um, yeah. But you don't lose sensation completely. And I think um, that's kind of important to, to know. Um, I, didn't, I didn't feel them like make the cuts or anything like that. Um, but when, when they are trying to get the baby out, and it happens very quickly. So from when they kind of say go um, to seeing your baby was like 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, you know, it was no time at all. Um, and I can only describe the sensation as like rummaging in a handbag for like keys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know that sounds really bizarre, but you, you kind of have a sense that you can kind of feel like they're looking for something and you can feel a bit of pulling and a bit of tugging. And also, you, well, I, I had a screen up, you know, I, I didn't want to see everything. <laughs> so I opted to have the screen up, but you can, you can see their, them above. Yeah. And you can kind of see them pulling and, you know, like that. So yeah. you, I suppose your eyes connect what you're seeing with what you're feeling a little bit. So you, right. your body sort of pieces the two together, but it's not, not uncomfortable at all. It's just a slightly, slightly bizarre feeling um like someone's looking for keys in your stomach <laughs> <laughs> I, was gonna say, I, I wouldn't imagine there's anything else that you go through in life that would feel similar um, no so not at all and then um like there's you know it was an amazing moment as well then you know they lift the baby up and you, you see your baby um and the most wonderful thing when you hear your baby cry for the first time a uh, really really emotional moment and then very quickly, they did do some really quick checks. So they did take him away. Um, so they didn't do skin to skin immediately. Um, so I, honestly, it felt like a minute or it didn't feel long at all that I didn't have baby. So I wasn't like, where is he or anything like that? Yeah. Um, and then quite quickly, they bring him back and pop him like on your chest. Um, and then the rest of the operation takes about... 45 minutes but it's the quickest 45 minutes of your life and you have no idea what they're doing because you've just been a baby's just been popped on your chest and you can you know see them right there oh. and you just you just spend an hour or the 45 minutes with your partner just staring and talking to your baby which is amazing oh, that's nice. uh, so you know the longer part of the operation goes much quicker than the first bit because you're just uh, looking at what you've achieved uh, which is amazing oh and how, how did your um how did your husband find it all sort of the before and during was he quite calm or yeah yeah I think um I think we're lucky because we were in this kind of p place between it wasn't an emergency but it wasn't quite planned it was like a sort of we were in this weird limbo between so it's maybe not quite like any other experience but um quite calm I think he said when he was um getting changed into scrubs that's when it, it felt quite oh goodness this is quite real oh. um, and he did say that he he kind of looked over the um screen that was up a few times just to sort of see what was going on and 
I think uh, he found that interesting, but did also sit down quite quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but what he did say was amazing is when, when it was the actual birth, he did look over and he saw, you know, he was able to say to me, like, I can see the umbilical cord, it's pulsing. And he was able to kind of watch it go kind of clear, you know, as the blood kind of goes through to baby. Um, yeah. So I think for him, that was quite, you know, good to watch. And it was nice for me to hear him telling me all this. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, he could have had the option to cut the cord, um, but we decided well, he didn't want to do that. So okay. that's fine. Um, but that is an option if people want that. Um, we also knew that Fergus was going to be a boy. Um, but they also, they asked us if we knew. Um, yeah. And I think if we hadn't known, then your birth partner could have told you that rather than someone else if you wanted that to be the yeah. case. Um, so there are those sorts of options too, uh, which is which is nice to know that yeah. you can do that if you want to. That's fab, and that makes it feel a bit more like um, you would be having a, a vaginal birth as well. You know, all those different yeah. options. So so that's fab that that's quite standard there as well. That's really good to hear. Um, yeah. especially at the moment as well so so that's bad that's really good um so so yeah so you said the, the stitching up a bit takes a wee while and then did you go straight to the postnatal ward or were you on a little recovery ward first yep yeah, so it was um we go to the old recovery ward which feels like right next door to the theater um so fergus was born about well 6 49 exactly um and then we spent around about say like an hour, hour and a half in the recovery room where it was just me, Fergus, my husband, and then a midwife coming in and out to do kind of checks and see how we're getting on and, and helping as well. Cause it's, you know, that kind of golden hour where you're trying to encourage and get breastfeeding established. Yeah. I would say I maybe thought that breastfeeding could get established in theater. That wasn't the case. Um, it's quite cold in there. Um, you, you haven't got much space. Because as you know, as I said, the you've lost kind of your feeling from your ribs down, um, and also the screens up, and you've got kind of um, like monitors stuck on you. So it would be quite yeah. complicated to do. I don't know if it's possible. Certainly in my case, it wasn't to to try breastfeeding in theatre, but it could happen. You know, forty five minutes later in the yeah. recovery room. Um, so yeah, and then the the hard thing with coronavirus is. By about 8.45, my husband had to, to leave, oh, um, yeah. you know, because it's, um, you know, really it's meant to be one hour after birth and we'd been given a little bit longer, which was great. Um, but at that point, that's when I was moving from the recovery room to the um, postnatal uh, ward. And that's when they said, sorry, visiting times are between 1 p.m. and 8 p.m. Um, so you'll have to go home. Um, but actually... Um, silver linings because it was an emergency we had no food in the house we hadn't set up the crib or the cots um, you know we hadn't organized things so it was nice that my husband was able to go home and begin that kind of preparation yeah that, you know we maybe were going to do the, the following week that we hadn't quite got around to yet um, so it's not like he was going home and you know not being useful it was actually really useful stuff yeah um, and the time flew between kind of nine o'clock and 1 p.m. when he could come back. Okay. Uh, it went really, really quickly. Um, but I would recommend for, for birth partners, you know, don't forget yourselves, like in terms of food and clothes and um, just looking after themselves. Because it is still, you know, it's quite, he was up all night too. And he witnessed something, you know, quite major as well. So it's quite a lot to process. Yeah, for sure. And I always think, it's hard because it's obviously this excitement you've got your new baby and it's amazing and wonderful um and then I always sort of try and say like maybe if birth partner goes home for a wee sleep and then when they come in they're a bit more refreshed and yeah. can help you out a bit more and maybe give you a chance to have a wee sleep as well um exactly. so but that's good they had things to do as well because it'll stop them just yeah. lying there wired thinking about it all <laughs> yeah he, he had plenty plenty to do and get organized um but then, yeah, so then we went up to labour ward, which, um, so for me, I was in a room with kind of four beds. Yeah. So there were three other, you know, ladies with their babies um, on the ward. So it is quite noisy um, at times because you've got four newborns potentially. Yeah. Um, 
always seemed to be when yours was quiet, one other's was crying, and then when they went quiet, yours uh -huh. was crying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the the I was there for three nights and, and four days in the end, which was a bit longer um, yeah. than I think. I think it was a bit longer than normal um, and a bit longer than I expected. Um, and the main reason for that was because baby was breech. Um, they wanted a physiotherapist just to check his um, legs and hips. Yeah. Um, so that's quite common with breech babies to sort of check that. Um, and I think especially because of uh, lockdown, there's quite a, lot of, a long delay to see physios at the moment. Right, okay. So they were really nice because they recommended I stay in hospital one more day um, just to see the physio rather than discharge me because then it could have been eight weeks to see a physio as an outpatient. Okay. Um, but so that so they're really you know they did give us options and things to think about so it seemed worthwhile and his hips were fine um, which no. is the good news yeah um, and then as well they do all the other tests you know like the normal like hearing tests and all the kind of usual checks that I think would happen for everybody yeah okay well that's good to know um, so and then when you, you did get home was it kind of in the afternoon you were discharged and did your husband come into the hospital to pick you up or meet you at the door? How did that work? Yeah, so um, so every day my husband was able to visit between 1 and 8 p.m. Um, and I would say one of the, 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 again, some of the benefits were, it's, I think it would be much, it's actually much quieter in the wards because you didn't have like a constant stream of visitors. Um, and actually I spoke to like all the other mums on the ward as well and we could all, you know, we all had a few teary moments and things like that, and everyone can support each other. Yeah. Um, which is actually really nice. And I, I don't know if that's, I don't think that's normal. The midwives certainly said, you know, this isn't how it usually is. And I think that's one of the, the benefits. And as well, husbands or partners being able to go home and sleep um, meant that after I'd had, you know, three pretty bad nights sleep, he'd had three good nights sleep. So it meant when we got home, we could kind of switch. And yeah. it was like, right this is the the time to flip the rules a bit um, but he was able to yeah he got discharged in the afternoon discharge takes quite a long time because there's quite a lot of paperwork they need to do and um with a c-section um i i didn't know this before um i'm sure if i'd had more time to read things i would have known that they give you blood thinning injections yeah um so you take them for 10 days um and you you do them yourself when you get home Yep. If you're not comfortable with that, a midwife could come and do it for you. But um, I promise I'm, I'm pretty pathetic and I, I managed to <laughs> do it because the needles are absolutely tiny. It's very, and you really don't feel it at all. You just inject it into your thigh. Um, and there's quite a lot of other medications. Like I had to write myself a little timetable oh, yeah. um, because there's different painkillers you can take. So regular paracetamol, ibuprofen. Um, but they can also offer you stronger things like um, like Oromor, which is like an oral morphine, yeah. the good stuff I called it. It's really <laughs> quite strong. And then they also prescribe with that something called lactolo lactolose, which is like a laxative as well, because um, after a C-section, it can take a little while for things to come through. Um, and especially if you're taking the Oromorph as well. Um, so there's quite a sort of concoction of medication. Um, but within, I think, 10 days or two weeks, I pretty much stopped taking uh, everything. So you sort of reduce your dosage down, um, with the exception of the injections, which you obviously have to continue for the full, the full yeah. 10 days. Um, but yeah, then my husband came to hospital um, to pick us both up, um, you know, comes in with the car seat. Uh, it had to be within, um, or you had to let them know what time he was coming because they have to fill in the track and trace forms and things like that. Right. Um, and then they want you, you know, they don't want him to hang around. So you, I sort of had to have everything ready to go, but he was able to come right into the ward to pick us both up. Okay, that's really good. And then that was that. And then we're, we're home. And then the next day, our midwife, community midwife came out to visit. So that was day five by that point. Okay. Um, just to sort of see how, how you're doing at home. So it's, again, it's quite nice to know that, you know, once you've left, to the hospital where you can just press a button and a midwife appears magically <laughs> um, it's nice to know that a midwife will come and visit you you know the day after you get home as well and yeah. uh, just to check up and things are going well that's really reassuring definitely 
And how did you find the, the car journey home out of interest? That's a question I get asked about a lot as well. Um, well, first of all, it's like dressing him to go outside. So you're thinking, oh gosh, you know, what do I put on a baby? Make sure he's warm enough, but not too warm. Um, uh, how do I put, you know, I'm glad we fit the car seat in advance, actually, because I understand that could be quite stressful. So I'm glad we kind of had already got that installed in the car. That's one thing we did do in advance, and I would recommend <laughs> for everyone to do that. That's a really um, tip. <laughs> yeah. uh, my husband has never drived more carefully in his life. Um, you know, never, always oh, sticking to that 20 mile an hour speed limit. Uh, but it was fine, and uh, Fergus loves the car. I oh. think it's that kind of rocking motion so he was good as gold the whole way and yeah. even since you know actually anytime we've been out in the car um I should know I can't drive because you're not usually recommended to drive for six weeks yeah. um, but I just sit right beside him in the back uh, just to gaze at him and watch him oh. um but he seems to really like the car so that, that was actually actually fine um and I think uh going forward if I couldn't settle him or something trip out in the car might do the job because it's that nice yeah. motion. Um, and was it comfortable enough for you as well with your incision and were you able to find a position that wasn't sore? Yeah yeah for me absolutely um you know you can you can put a pillow or something between the seat belt and your incision if you wanted um I think I actually had like quite a big jumper or jacket on at the time so I didn't need that um but the seat belt does it's at that awkward place where it is right over over your wound yeah. um so yeah make, but you'll have you'll probably have a pillow with well, with you anyway as most people will because it's yeah. often one of the things you pack um Take your own pillow in yeah um which actually they, they have lo lots of pills at hospitals so I, I don't think you even need one but um if yeah. you do take your own or just have one in the car yeah um, but in terms of the recovery um Initially, my recovery was going quite well, um, but then unfortunately, I developed a bit of an infection in the wound uh, and a hematoma, which is just like a, basically a bruise, I guess. Yeah. Um, a fancy name for a bruise. Yeah. It sounds more glamorous <laughs> than it is. Um, so I've been on two courses of antibiotics. Um, and I think, yeah, the, I, I'm quite sort of an active person. And I think the hardest thing for me has been just kind of reminding yourself that you have had major surgery yeah um, I think you, you forget because it was such a positive experience and you just think no that's the day I met Fergus like you don't think that's the day I had an operation yeah um, and often I find that that's what the midwives and health visitors have been reminding me is like don't forget what, what you went <laughs> yeah um, and yeah just just taking it easy um because it is it is quite you know it's quite painful it's it's in a quite a tender place so in terms of getting up and about it's been a bit harder than I thought it would be yeah um so but now I'm at almost at well three and a half weeks so I'm still reminding myself that you know they say it's at least six weeks for a recovery if not longer yeah. um and it does seem to be improving um but things that have really helped have been the kind of obvious like batch cooking easy meals um and also, I suppose the other benefit of, of lockdown is I'm glad my camera is this way around because you can't see the rest <laughs> of my room. Uh, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And yeah. just, yeah, being kind to yourself. And it just means that, you know, just looking after baby and they recommend you only lift things as heavy as your baby. Uh, so if you've got a supportive partner at home, you know, this is their real opportunity to shine. And yeah. Um, I'm really lucky my husband's working from home and that's made a massive difference um, in terms of recovery as well, just because I'm not able to do as much as I, I think I normally would be. Yeah. Um, just that, taking time. That's quite a good benefit. I actually hadn't thought of that with partners working from home just now. Obviously, it's going to feel a, a little bit like extended paternity leave um, yeah. rather than that point where they have to go back after two weeks. So, so that's quite good. Oh, it's a huge, in, in our case, it's a huge benefit. And it just means, you know, if he's sleeping, um, you know, we can pop him in the baby box in our kind of spare room with my husband working, keeping an eye on him while I have a sleep. So yeah. um, the, the kind of cliche sleep when the baby sleeps is, is not a cliche, like definitely recommend it. You can, um, you can. yeah. Uh, just especially in the early days. Oh, that's good. Sounds like you're finding your feet really well, which is lovely to hear. 
Uh, well, not quite literally finding my feet, but yeah, we're, we're, we're sitting on the sofa and having lots of cuddles. Well, <laughs> that's good. That's fab. And so what would be, if somebody was to ask you for your top tips for the birth or postnatal even, what would you like to share with other people? Um, oh, it's a good question. I think um, just maybe having an open mind, um, you know, what my what my expectations were and what the reality was were quite quite different um the, the staff are amazing um you know you can and i think actually one of the acronyms that i learned through was something like the brain acronym so you know the asking yourself what are the benefits what are the risks you can help me remind me what the other is alternatives yeah instinct nothing yeah um and that was really helpful the whole way through. Um, you know, for me going for the ECV, what are the benefits, risks, alternatives? What's my instinct say? What would do nothing? Yeah. Um, because I'm glad I tried it because that meant that, you know, the C-section, you know, I had tried other things before I got there. Yeah. So that was helpful. Um, breath, like I didn't, I, I always thought how useful can breath be? Um, but breath is useful even in a C-section. Um, Marcelo, I'm so pleased to hear you say that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I used breath when I was feeling nervous. So I used breath when they put the, the spinal in because, yeah. you know, I just wanted to feel calm. So, you know, when I was breathing out, that's when they put it in. Um, when I was lying down, you know, just before everything began, you're, you're feeling a little bit anxious. Again, just focusing on your breath is a really nice way to just relax yeah <laughs> um, after baby's born and the breastfeeding's not going well breath. <laughs> you know so it's it that always coming back to that and then um definitely just asking for help um you know for it for everything like picking things up off the floor like yeah it, i remember what a milestone it felt like when i could pick up like something off the floor <laughs> yeah. myself which you know because the first the first day you just can't because it's too painful um, but quite quickly you can and it feels like a major achievement so just taking things slow and I need to remind myself of that because I'm beginning to be like oh can I can I go for a longer walk can I um can I go for a jog can I do some yoga no like yeah just just chill out and, <laughs> and that's what I need to tell myself just relax and enjoy the cuddles um I suppose that would be some advice and um not listening to other people too you know I think everyone has their, you know, don't listen to me because <laughs> yeah. everyone will have their own experience and their own preferences and, and just do what feels right for, for you. That's um, really good a, advice. Really. A C-section wasn't what I thought I, you know, wasn't what I want, necessarily wanted, but it was, it was incredible and I wouldn't, wouldn't have it any other way now. Yeah. Um, like I would do, do it again. <laughs> That's really good to know. That's really reassuring. And that's some really good advice you've given as well. Um, I think it's always nice to hear from somebody, especially somebody that's recently had the experience as well. So, um, so yes, yeah, so that's fab. Um, I think that was everything. You sort of ticked all the, the questions already that I wanted to, to ask. You just went through it. Um, yeah, you've covered it all already. So that was really good. Thank you. Oh no, my pleasure. It's nice, nice to be able to talk about it. And before I forget, because it's amazing, um, amazing how quickly you do. You know, for me, it was only just over three weeks ago, but um, quickly other things take up your mind. Um, yeah. So yeah, definitely um, recommend it. And the the staff were just incredible. So so grateful for the incredible sort of support that we get. We're we're so lucky to have all of that. So yeah, and it's totally worth it. For like this little one. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Just putting oh, his hand in front of his face. Know. Camera shy. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And he's been so well behaved as well during our wee chat. He's slept to be. Always like this. Oh. So. <laughs> so tiny. And how much yeah. did he weigh? That's one of the important questions everybody has to ask. And he was uh, seven pounds three. Oh, that's a good uh, yeah, seven three. So and now he's already gained six hundred grams, I think. So it's already feeling a lot weightier. Yeah, so. I can imagine, that. especially. And they always say C-section babies are good-looking babies too. So yeah. there's another <laughs> secret benefit. 
<laughs> I know, bless, not have to have the head squishing bit. So, <laughs> oh. so that's a secret benefit that no one really thinks about. I will so. remember to pass that on in future. That's a good one. <laughs> Oh, that's brilliant. Well, thank you again so much for your time today. Um, and I will go and update this and do all the fancy editing bits and get it uploaded. No, you're my pleasure. It was great to talk to you. Enjoy the rest of your day and uh, yeah, you too. just get in touch if you want to chat at any point if you're... Yeah, okay. and I hope, so, hope, that was, hope that was useful and um, yeah, just good to chat and talk through it. So yeah.